Hello and welcome to Stories, the True and the Fictional, the variety show that revolves around one central theme, stories and the people that tell them. If you haven't done so already, hit subscribe and ring that notification bell. And hey, if you're feeling up for it, leave a comment down below, let us know you subscribe and we will give you a shout out. Hello and welcome to Story Chat. Guess what's happening, Ryan? What's happening, Jamie? We're having our second Australian on the podcast. Well, that's that team for the year, isn't it? Well, you were complaining about it. <laughs> um, all the way from Brisbane, Jack mm-hmm. Roney, thanks for coming on. G'day, guys. It's uh, great to be here. I really appreciate you reaching out and, uh, and organising this chat. It's, um, yeah, I've been looking forward to it. Excellent. Excellent. And look, we still, we're still feeling at home because there is still a bit of a time difference between Brisbane and Sydney. <laughs> So you, you technically still are an international guest on a different time zone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think, it, but I think uh, daylight savings ends in about a week's time. So you can, yep. uh, you and that's can... why I said to Jamie, we need to get this interview in March, so uh, <laughs> that you can technically still be. You're an hour behind. It's about six thirty over there. Yeah, it? that's right. There you go. So still the time travel. <laughs> Not, not enough leeway for lotto tickets, though. But, um. no. <laughs> we get a lot no. of our guests ask us for lotto ticket numbers and stuff like that when they're, they're a bit behind in the UK. So Yeah, and I, was, you know, I that saw joke. one of those podcasts with uh, one of your guests from the UK. So you were talking about predicting the, the lotto numbers. So I like that. <laughs> yes, we could all use a bit of extra cash, I think. <laughs> but, um, all right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to get into the icebreakers, which are questions we ask all of our guests. So um, just five simple questions and then we'll, we'll get into all about yourself and, and your career and your books and everything like that. So sure. um, I'm just working out my, yeah, I'm going to take the first one because my favourite question is number three. And Jamie has no, <laughs> no control over me telling that question. So, okay. <laughs> all right, if you could get rid of one thing in this world, what would it be? I was going to talk about, you know, wars and peace in the world and all that, but I, th- I thought I'd... Um, Talk about cane toads. Yes. I hate cane toads. And here in Brisbane, it's still quite hot. We're still getting the sort of tropical weather and we've had so much rain this summer. And there are bloody cane toads everywhere. And I've got two dogs, I've got a Labrador and a, and a Spoodle pup. And I've got to go outside to our, into our backyard at nighttime with a torch and a weapon, yep. uh, a stabbing utensil. I've, I think I've killed about five cane toads in the last two nights with a, a metal rake, which is which is nice and sharp because they're, they're bloody dangerous. If, if they spit at your dogs, they can kill your dogs. So we can't even take our, our dogs out to the backyard to, to go to the toilet without being threatened by these killer cane toads. Um, so yeah, if, if the world could eradicate the cane toad, it would be a better place. hundred percent, hundred percent. They should start paying you guys to kill them up there. You know, the amount of cane toads you get. Well, I know up North up in the tropics, they, they kill them by the millions and they bag yeah. them up and turn them into fertilizer. <laughs> Oh, there you go. But they're making way down south and they'll be down down in your oh, way before you know it. No, no, we get enough of them during the state of origin. We don't want any more. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, state of origin is football. I'm aware. Football. Rugby league. I'm, Rugby league. <laughs> I'm, I'm a round ball football fan. Oh, you're a soccer fan? Yes. Yeah. The real football. Yeah. yeah. So who, who would you who who's your favorite club uh, locally in uh, FC uh, in England? Premier League. Oh, look, Brisbane Raw, of course, here in the, in the A League. And yep. um, uh, in the Premier League, I kind of, I'm a bit of a fence sitter. My son likes Man U, but I kind of, I'm a bit of a fence sitter, whoever's winning. I, I like Man United at the moment. <laughs> Man City, Man City. Well, I had to, I support Leicester because um, a lot of my my uh, family come from that area up there. So, um, but yeah, the, but the most important question about soccer is, do you like Ted Lasso? <laughs> Have you watched that yet? No, no, I haven't. I've heard about it, but I haven't watched it yet. Absolutely fantastic soccer show. Okay, I'll have to check it out. It's really good. If you want to laugh and you want to like, it, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty spot on with the like with the Premier League over there, and in terms of you know rules and and stuff like that, and um, they have to pay a, a a lot of money to actually get stuff shot on the fields over there. Yeah, I bet. You know, because they the, the Premier League's like we don't want anything <laughs> other than soccer games played on here. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you'll have to check it out. And yeah, of course, you know. let's not even talk about the Socceroos after their disaster against no, Japan no. earlier this week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's I, follow, let's... I only follow English soccer. I'm a bit of a traitor there. I don't. I only yeah. I only follow a bit of the Premier League. 
No, well, yeah. I, I remember the glory days because because my my um thing that I like to say that I love is when I was a kid, I played for the same club that uh, Mark Schwarzer did. But 10 years after, <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. Um, what club yeah, was that? Um, it was called Colo. So it was, it was a local, you know, kids club kind of thing. Yep. Okay, but, um, cool. That's your, your claim to fame, Jamie. That's my claim to fame. I mean, you live up bush in the mountains. I, I, so. I've, I've met a few celebrities, you know, a few people <laughs> on net, but, you know, same club as, as Schwarzer. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad this is not the, the interview with Jamie podcast. So we, we'll oh, okay. we those stories for another time. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, well, Jack, um, tell us something on your bucket list. Uh, I had to think about this one, but I reckon I'd probably jump out a perfectly good plane and go skydiving. It's something I've never had the guts to do. Or, or bungee jumping, they're, they're two of the things I'd always said that if I was on a show like The Mole or Survivor and I, and I had to do it, if I, if I was motivated to do it, I would. Um, but yeah, they're, they're definitely two things. Jumping, jumping out of something high towards the ground at a fast rate of knots is on my bucket list. So you are you afraid of heights or well I me I couldn't do it I'm I'm absolutely terrified of heights so is that just something or you just had just haven't had a chance to get around to it Yeah look I'm a bit of a wuss I, I probably have had a chance to do um, bungee jumping when I was up in Cairns a number of years ago but I, I bailed because I didn't really have to it was it was kind of a choice but I think it's one of those things if I really had to and the world was watching I probably would do it but, but um, I'm not I'm okay with heights but I think bungee jumping and jumping out of a plane is kind of next level. So I'm um, definitely that's something I'd like to do before I, I leave this earth. Okay, look, well, when 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 the next book comes out, okay, we'll do it live from the inside of a plane, and then you'll you'll have you'll have people. I mean, I think we're up to about twelve hundred watches now, so you'll have people watching, and then we'll, you'll have to jump out of the plane, and there we go. We'll help you with the bucket list. Yeah, that's uh, another another definition of a book launch. I'll launch myself <laughs> out of a plane. How's that sound? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. No, that's that's a good one because. Um, you know, the good thing about having you on as an Australian is most of the people we talk to say that their bucket list is to come to Australia. So <laughs> we were guaranteed to get a different answer from you either way. Yeah. So Well, with all the COVID restrictions, that's also my bucket list is to actually leave, <laughs> leave Australia for, for a while. <laughs> oh, I tell, I'll tell you what, my, my old man, he, he's a caravaner, he's retired. He caravans, he's currently in week two of a 47-week caravan trip. Around um, around Australia, first one since COVID dropped, and um, you know he he couldn't have been happier. So he, I definitely agree with that. Right, excellent. All right, next question. This is the one where I always tell people that we're going to judge very harshly on. <laughs> but um, you know, you're you're a former detective, so I might go easier on you because you know you might my my, my one my my greatest fear is to ever go to jail so i don't want to help you fulfill that wish that fear of mine (laughs) so please tell us what now now we split the the original question is what is the greatest sitcom ever made i split it into what do you think is the greatest sitcom ever made and if it's different what is your favorite sitcom well i have to say the same for both questions happy days happy days yeah happy days with the fonz it just brings back great childhood memories and every time i hear that theme song of that um you know, the, the starting theme song i just love it i think for me that's the best cool. it's definitely a good one i grew up on it too i remember saturday afternoons um i think it used to be around 5 30 in the afternoon just before the news mum and dad would yeah. let down and watch it yeah. uh you know because it keeps quiet while the news was on and um, yeah I, I absolutely agree and look at what we we got you know one of one of the greatest uh, you know directors and producers of ron howard out of it he's done some amazing movies and obviously henry winkler you can't go wrong there yeah but, um you know robin williams from more Mindy, you know like yeah yeah great launch pad for a lot of different stars and back in the old days when they used they used to film in, a, in front of a live studio audience it was actually yeah. a real audience and yeah just the performances and you know hearing that audience laugh at the key moments uh it's just something special about that that show 100 percent. and you don't even see that nowadays even with shows that sound like it is it's all just canned laughter from a computer. You know what yeah. I mean? You don't get that anymore. So great yeah. answer. They're very, very good. Past the with flying colours. Excellent. <laughs> cool. All right. The, the, time for the fun one. Uh, do you have a zombie apocalypse plan up there in Brisbane? 
Well, I thought about this. If there's one guy that I, if I ever had to go on a, a zombie apocalypse with it, there's, it's my niece's um, partner. He's an ex-soldier and he's also a pig hunter. So he's got this cabin that's made out of two um, shipping containers and he's turned it into like a hunter's cabin. And uh, it's up on a hill in kind of a remote countryside um, out near the Blue Mountains. It's beautiful country, cattle, cattle country. And it's up high with a magnificent view. You'd see any zombies coming. You've got a 360 degree view. Uh, and he, he's the man I'd want to be with. So we pack up our family and our pets and go and hunker down in this cabin. Um, we've got, there's plenty of weapons up there. So um, that's, I reckon that's where I'd feel safe being hiding behind him. There you go. That's set. You're set. <laughs> That's, I think that's the best answer we've had. I mean, I used to say I'd go to Bunnings and you'll find me a guess that I'd be actually, that actually understands what Bunnings is. Um, I'm trying to describe it to some of the Americans and the UK listeners. They've got no idea, but yeah. yeah no, that's, I, I, yeah. I mean, why not take advantage of that? Yeah, absolutely. You know? Oh, that's a great answer. And the final one, this is another good one we love. Um, so you've just received a call from Elon Musk. He calls up. He's just invented an electric time machine. What do you do and where do you go? He wants you to test, test drive it. Yeah, I thought about that. I've actually written a, a fourth book, which is getting released later this year. It's different to the normal crime stuff I write. It's, it's, it's a historical um, speculative fiction with a bit of time travel in it. And go, it goes back to the past to a historical event. So I've often sort of daydreamed about going back in the past, but I'm, I'm figuring I'd love to go into the future and I'd love to go into the distant future, say 1,000 or even 2,000 years into the future. Mm -hmm. And then we become the ancients. I'd love to know what the world's going to be like if hopefully the planet is still around by then um, and what the future humans have evolved into and how they consider us when they look back at us as the ancient humans, like mm -hmm. we do to the Egyptians and the Romans. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to go that far into the future just to get a feel for what, what the world has become. I think that's a very good idea. I think a lot of people go, oh, I want to go back to this time, back to this time, yeah. you know, because you sort of know, you know, you know the different eras, but if you're jumping through to the future, it's a blind jump. You know what I mean? If you're going not even a hundred, like if you're going 500 to a thousand years, it's a complete and utter blind jump. You've got no idea what's going to happen. You've got no idea who's going to be, if, if humans are still going to be around and that's a big, big risk. You've got to, now he does give you a little, watch things so you got to make sure that you don't damage that because that's how you get back otherwise if you start you could go you could be there and be a prophet or something like that could be the planet of the apes could be a real thing so <laughs> I'm, I'm, i'd love to know where we become or whether we you know by then we've grown two heads and um <laughs> telepathic abilities who knows it'd be funny yeah. if you landed in a zoo when you got there <laughs> well that's it who knows humans might even be in zoos a thousand years yeah. from the future yeah you know we could we don't know who's what who or what if we're still going to be running it running the world in a thousand years but i like that that's a very good answer cool. so all right let's let's crack into the main portion of the reasons why we've got you on board so we'll start off why don't you tell us a bit about yourself or you know what you've been doing for for your years on this planet and uh, and then we'll get into some questions yeah, so I live in Brisbane, born and bred in Queensland. I was actually born and raised in the, the city of Toowoomba. That's about an hour and a half west of, of Brisbane. Um, joined the police academy straight out of high school. I was 17 when I joined the police academy. I'm 51 now, so I think it's about 34 years. So I'm still a serving police officer, but I've taken a year off at the moment so I can try and work work out what I want to do when I grow up finally. And, and mm -hmm. I just needed a bit of time. About, I'm well and truly institutionalized after having spent so much time uh, in, in the job. Um, so I've just taken a, a break away. I've got uh, happily married. I've um, uh, got three kids, three grown up kids. Um, and I've moved around Queensland through my job and, and have ended up in Brisbane where we've been here probably for about the last 16 years or so. We've, we've consolidated here in Brisbane, but I have moved around a bit. Uh, to other places. Um, I started kind of tinkering with writing just it must have been about 2002, 2003. At that time, I was a, a child protective detective. So I saw a lot of fairly sad cases, mm -hmm. a lot of child abuse, neglect, all that sort of stuff. And I was immersed in that world for a long time. And I, I always say I was probably in a fairly dark place at the time. I didn't realize it. And I kind of felt the need then to start writing. And, and I started writing fiction. Some people probably write a diary, but for me, I, I had all this stuff swirling around in my head and I couldn't really make sense of it so for me to do that I started writing and I was involved in a particular homicide investigation where some kids uh, witnessed their parents being killed and it was my job to come in and, and, and interview the kids to 
uh, to find out what they'd seen and, and their their information was quite important in the in the overall scheme of the investigation. So I became heavily involved in that case. I, I got to know the kids quite well and ha had an ongoing sort of relationship with them uh, as as we you know, led led into the court case. So that for me, that I started writing the story. It was a couple of years later that I started writing the story and. I pretty much used all my experiences as a police officer and particularly as a child protection detective um, to kind of inspire that first book, which is called The, the Angels Wept. Um, and uh, it is, I have to say, it is fiction. I, I certainly have been inspired by people I've met along the way. Um, and that was my way of kind of making sense of the things that I'd experienced and some of the things that are wrong with the world and wrong with people, but also some of the good things about the world and, and a lot of the good traits of people. So for me, that was just my way of purging everything that I was carrying around, wrote this book, didn't really do much with it, um, put it away. And then I pulled it out of the cobwebs only recently and have since um, done a lot of editing, had it published. And I've also written book two, book three, and they'll be, they'll be released um, later this year and next year. And I've also got a fourth book, which is mm. that one I mentioned before, the, the time travel historical book, which is uh, due for release later this year as well. Excellent. Now, well, now that you've mentioned that you, you know, you spent a lot of your career in the child protective services, uh, having read, you know, started reading the book, I can see where, I can see why you picked that direction for it to go down. You know, as you said, you of what you've seen, and it, it's kind of a bit of like I, I could imagine it'd be kind of a little bit therapeutic to be able to get some of that stuff out and in, into your writing because reading about um you know some of the, the things in the first couple of chapters that you know you see and, and some of the the instances that happen in Lockyer where your your book set um you know that I feel that you'd have to have done some work in that department during your career yeah and, and I, I often describe it as that, that I kind of bled those words onto the page that was it was very therapeutic at the time I didn't realize it wasn't probably until later on when I'd kind of purged it, written it. And then I eventually moved out of that line of work. I was in that work for about 14 years, probably spent too long in that, that line of work. And I've since moved out into other parts of um, my policing career and then moved into training and um, media and communications and other sort of more corporate roles as well. So I've got a sort of a mix of both operational training and, and corporate experience. Um, but for me, that was a way of closing the book on that chapter of my life. And then I was able to move on. When I started writing book two, several late years later, it was less about me purging all the stuff I was carrying around. It was more about me just wanting to be a better writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I wrote book three, um, that was about ramping it up and trying to write a really good yarn, a good sort of edgy seat thriller um, that kind of links back to book one. So what I ended up doing when I first wrote the, the angels wept i didn't realize it was going to be part of a three book series it was just going to be a standalone book uh, in fact i don't really know when i started writing i really had no plan mm. at all mm. um but then as i started to get some traction with it i i, I saw that the character jared o'connor the the main detective i felt that he had more more to say and i felt that there was still room to progress the story so i wrote the sequel and then uh, a number of years after that i wrote book three and i really uh, wanted to really ramp it up in terms of his turmoil and uh, and some of the things he was experiencing and it linked back to book one so if you if you read book one two and three in sequence you'll get an overall picture of the storyline however having said that you can read each three each of the three books as standalone books as well yeah well i think you've answered a question that that we did have you know do you when you know do you see the the jared o'connor series going longer than three books or i mean i must admit he's very the character of of, of Jared O'Connor, and we'll, we'll come to a little bit more of that soon. He, he um it grabbed me, you know, like he he. I think you could get some more out of that. Like I already want books two and three, and I haven't even finished one yet. Oh, that's, so that's great. You know, I'm not I'm not just saying that because it's I'm a big fan. I I, I find your and I hope you don't mind me saying your writing style is very compa comparable to one of my favorite authors. I don't know if you've heard of them, PJ Tracy. No. It's, they base theirs on a detective story that spans six books. Um, really, like if you get a chance, check it out. But it's I got, my mother passed those books on to me, and I've read them multiple times. It's a similar sort of vibe, and it's just yeah. And they've sold millions and millions and millions of books, so I have no no doubt that this is going to you know be able to go really really well because you know I'm I read probably. Like four or five books a month easily okay. yeah and um i just can't get this one out of my head for some reason i just I literally have not time work is just killing me and i just all i want to do is 
Just sit down and finish well, what, it. So, what I'll do, Ryan, I've actually got... Here's the paper, paperback sheet. Oh, hang on. Bloody blue, uh, green screen. Well, that's okay. Oh, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yep. Kind of. Bloody technology green screen. So I've, got the, <laughs> I've got the paperback anyway, and uh, I'll sign one and I'll send it to you. Oh, that is just, as, as, right. just as right. I, I think having the, the paperback, you know, having the, the book in your hand is better than the, the ebook version. So I'll send that to you. Oh, that'd be awesome. Thank you very much for that. No, really my pleasure. Our plan worked right now. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question about the Jared O'Connor, the detective, I wanted to write about, I mean, we all see, you know, Die Hard and the Bruce Willis and the, and the typical pain detective who smokes cigars, he's an alcoholic, he's got mental health issues, he's got a broken marriage, he doesn't speak to his kids and, you know, workaholic and all that. That's so stereotypical of the det detectives you see on TV. But, you know, I just wanted to write about a normal a normal policeman that that's typical of a, of a policeman anywhere and around Australia. And, and this particular detective is, he's a family man. He's, he's happily married. He's got two kids and he goes home and sees his kids, even though this investigation is wearing him down and, and wearing down the relationships with his, with his wife and kids, but he's got a supportive wife and he's not an alcoholic and he's generally a good guy, you know, and uh, there are some internal conflicts that happen within his organization and, and that sort of thing. But I just wanted to write about an authentic detective and, and just sort of break away from the, the typical, you know, the stereotypes that you see. A hundred percent. And and what I love about it is in the early, like in the early parts of the book, just to see the relationship that he has with the people in the town. Like um, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, you know, when he gets called out to the, uh, the first uh, domestic violence, case with you know he's it's it with a guy that he's grown up with and he, he's reflecting back on you know when how far these guys have come and you know that he the guy won't talk to anyone but jared o'connor and um you know i just love that i get that feeling straight away that you know yeah he's he's also he, he's got a loving family he loves his kids loves his wife but you know he's also got to worry about these other people that have got not that not taken the the routes that he's taken and i think that's really good and just keeps the story flowing and makes you feel for the characters a lot more so yeah and and jared has got he's still you know carrying around some demons things yeah. that, that he carries around he has nightmares and some previous experiences that he's still carrying around but yeah there, there's these extra characters that at first you think how are they going to play a part in 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 the in the overall homicide investigation and there's these kind of juvenile offenders that he mm -hmm. he's built this rapport with and they're, they're real characters and and because he's built this rapport with these street kids mm -hmm. um they they're willing to speak to him and it turns out they pass on some pivotal information that is crucial to in, in, into the investigation but that's because of who he is and the way he has the ability to relate to the street kids so i wanted to kind of weave that into it as well I, and i got that from the first meeting that he had when they when him and his partner went to the the warehouse and, you know, they, they found the little kid and, you know, the, the way that he was acting towards the police, you know, the typical little brats and I'm not telling you anything, copper. And, you know, and, and then Jared just takes him aside and says, look, when was the last time you had something to eat? And, you know, takes him to the restaurant and sits him down and gives him some food and, you know, and then you can see that relationship there and, why they might trust him a little bit more than the other police there. Yeah, that's right. It's about developing trust and, and, um, to the point where even you know another another guy he arrests is in, is in the lockup and he um, he's built a relationship with him and you know one night he's he's had to you know capsicum spray some knife wielding guy and the next minute the same guy is is uh, passing on information to him because he's built that that respect and that that street credibility um, so I wanted definitely wanted to build that as part of his character he, he's definitely not a he's not a door kicking he's a he's a fairly sort of I guess you call it he's a more of a, a gentle sort of guy, you know, because that's the role he's in. He's a child protection detective. He's he's not a door kicker. He's not a thug. He's not one of those, you know, stereotypical hard nosed detectives. He's he's a he's got a bit of a soft edge to him, um, but because of that, he's got this ability to to really form relationships with with people that probably a lot of other police can't form relationships with. Hundred percent, and and I agree with what you say in terms of stereotypical. It's probably one of the first, um, you know, detective books that I've read where he gets more information from just being himself and being relatable than using fear and, you know, threats and stuff to, to get what he needs. He's more of, he's able to find a way to get that information without, you know, having to look like a hard ass all the time. Yeah. And I've just, I've often been asked how, how would I describe him? And I kind of describe Jared O'Connor, the detective as he's a reluctant hero. He's not, he's not setting out to be a hero or to big note himself, whereas others are. 
Um, he's sort of he's in the peripheral doing his job quietly, but he gets thrust into this situation where he has to step up to the plate. And he is a bit reluctant, but you know he is he's he's really taken out of his comfort zone. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm going to let Jamie do some talking because I've Yay! been talking. <laughs> I just seriously the yeah. you know the the book just got me, and I'll stop I'll stop talking about that because people are thinking they're going to think you paid us to say that, which you didn't. Uh-oh. <laughs> It's well, I'll page you. I'm sending you a book as a bribe, so. Oh, um, no, look. <laughs> regardless, I would, I would still, I, I still, Jamie knows, I still will buy, you know, I'll be buying books two and three regardless. So I appreciate that anyway. Great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, still on um, Jared O'Connor, like, um, was he inspired by anyone in real life or um, did he come from a TV show or like, like where did the character come from to your mind, essentially? I just wanted to de- depict, uh, I suppose at the time I was writing it, I was doing a similar job myself, but I wanted to um, depict a character that um, I, I suppose I wanted to show to the world that these guys are well-respected, they're highly skilled. Um, you know, the, I do write about there's a bit of internal conflict between some other hard-nosed detectives who kind of have this view that a child protection detective is a, some sort of a lower form detective. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to show that these guys are highly regarded and you know they have the ability to to talk to to children and, and victims in really traumatic circumstances. Um, and I just really wanted to showcase the work that those, um, uh, what's what's called the Child Protection Investigation Unit, I just wanted to showcase the work that they do. And I suppose it's, you know, it is outside the norm. Most of these um, crime detective novels have generally got, you know, your, your Jack Reacher, your hard nose kind of yeah. you know, heroes. Whereas I wanted to talk about a different kind of detective that a lot of people probably never heard of before. No, I agree. You, you're very well. I don't think I've ever heard. Like, obviously, we know of child protective detect like uh, police, but I don't think I've ever read a story about one. So it it gives you that different perspective. That you know, like you say, it's not just the 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 homicide detective who you know needs just he's you know due to retire and he just got to say you know I mean it's 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 I think that's what makes it so good. It's just it's something that you've never really you never see. You know, on on oh, how do you say? It? You never you never really see it on display, and I think that's why it's it's such a good read. And the nature of the job is very uh, under the radar because most of the, the work that that we do as as a child protection detective is and dealing with juvenile offenders. Um, it's the sort of stuff you generally can't talk about because it's yeah. there's a lot of confidentiality issues and yeah. you're dealing with family turmoil. So it's not the sort of thing that often makes the the front page of the newspapers. Exactly. Right. So I suppose you wouldn't you wouldn't be pulling much. Um, well, I wouldn't say inspiration, but like you're not copying cases that you've actually worked on. You may pull inspiration from them, but you wouldn't per se go here's a case that you've worked on, but kept it. Um, you know, like shown it to the world essentially. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, there's, I've got to be very careful of conflict of interest given given my my job, and yeah. um, that's why I've had to be very careful to to stress. Look, this it's a fictional story. Yes, I have been inspired by my own policing experiences and and the characters are probably um, a, a, an amalgamation of different people I've met along along the way, both internally and externally. And um, But yeah, I, I do have to stress that I've drawn for ideas from some of the things yeah. I've experienced, but the stories and scenes are, are fictional, but I'm hoping that through my own policing experience, so I can definitely add that authenticity to, mm. to it and paint an accurate picture as to what yeah. goes on behind the scenes in, in any given police station. Yeah, hundred percent. They say you write what you know. And um, you know what I mean. You you do that by, by, as you say, not giving away sort of any uh, of too much. But you you know you know as you said, you've worked in the in the child protection sector. You've worked in the operations sector sector, and you know in dealing with that, can form that character that becomes Jared O'Connor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just interested about like the the way you craft your mystery because it's a mystery and a, a crime thriller. Yeah, so um, yeah. Hmm. is it true that you got to kind of build it backwards i've heard that some people write the crime backwards and then you know spread it out or how do you go about writing your mystery i think for mine it's probably i guess for the first part there is that mystery element of trying to work out who's behind this and that there's more than one key player here um there's a bit of manipulation going on and and so there's there's more than one one offender um but then it gets to the point that the 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 true offender the mastermind reveals themselves and then it becomes less of a mystery and more of a cat and mouse. Yeah. So it's not your typical whodunit. 
you yep. know, at, at first there is that element of mystery. And, and for me, the story kind of just evolved. And, and I, I wrote a particular scene, which was a, a homicide scene. I, that was the first chapter I actually wrote. And then I thought, yeah, I, I think I can do this writing thing. That was my chance to really have a go at writing because it was such a, a powerful scene and powerful thing that I experienced in real life. And then I kind of built this fictional story uh, around it and it kind of just evolved from there. So I didn't really have a start. I didn't go from A to A to Z. Yeah. Um, I started it, you know, in the middle and kind of went back and then went forward and then add different la layers to it. Uh, it was a work in progress for a number of years. No, excellent. Uh, yeah, uh, you can you can definitely tell like the, the different aspects in the book, you know, you've gone from obviously what Jack, Jack uh, sorry, Jared, I was going to say what Jack Rooney's invest, <laughs> what Jared O'Connor's investigating to begin with to, you know, switching scenes to, I just can't remember the names of them, you know, with the the family where, you know, the wife just started acting strange and, um, you know, has gone off to, to meet with certain people and, and, you know, the father's had to grab the kids and pull them out of the situation. And, you know, just for, it, it's for that. And I've just read that and I've gone, okay, I want to know more about the Jared O'Connor, but I also want to know what's going on here because something's clearly going on here and then the way to weave it all together. So yeah, yeah, there's kind of a bit, a few backstories that do tend to they they come together um, and culminate into the kind of the the the, the pivotal plot. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, okay, my next question. I'm just trying. Well, you have you 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 can tell you definitely work with the police force because you've answered some of our questions before we've even asked. Um, aside from the book four that you were talking about, the historic not book four, the fourth book, the historical time travel story. Have you got anything else in the works? Like, have you have you thought about, you know, this possibly getting adapted into movie, TV, series, anything like that? I have actually had a conversation with someone who's in the, has got experience in the, in the screen industry about the idea of this crime series. You know, is it something that could be uh, a series, season one, season yeah. two, season three, yeah. and, you know, that sort of thing. I, I love um, Jane Harper as an Australian author and, and her book, The Dry, which was converted yes, into a, a, a film with, with Eric yeah, Banner. Right. And I kind of use that as inspiration. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, I try to kind of follow that kind of style and, and genre in, in my own writing. Um, but yeah, no, definitely the thought is there, you know, I, I guess we can all dream, but I, I definitely have had some conversations about that. People have said they could definitely see this kind of story on the screen. So 100%. Uh, who knows? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, I mean, the, I think uh, well, I was talking about this when we had Matt Holmes on, like Stan at the moment, the streaming service Stan is very, very, like when I look at it, is Australian based with, they, they love to get their Australian series made, Australian, you know, movies and and generally probably out of all the streaming services has got the most Australian content on there. Um, I could definitely see this as like a gritty, I, I, it would work as a movie, but I think you'd get more out of it as a, as a TV show, as a grit, even like a, a, you know, a Netflix drum Netflix um, show as well. Cause I think it, I, I could definitely in reading it, I could definitely form the images in my mind and I could see it playing out quite easily. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I tried to create a sense of place as well within the town. Yes. Yeah. So you know, I think yeah. Look, it, it would it would be great to um to to get picked up and and be and have someone take interest in in converting it to screen and and turning it from a manuscript into a into a screenplay. Um, but who knows? You know, who knows? I, I kind of feel that my writing career has started to hit a bit of a I've, I've hit some momentum. Yeah. And, um, this first book and and with books coming have sort of built the, the platform for, for what's to come. So look, who knows? I guess it's every writer's dream to to be successful as a writer and also to have their books adapted to film. But uh, we'll wait and see. I won't get ahead of myself. No, look, I, I honestly, maybe we should get Matt Holmes involved. <laughs> I think he, he He'd probably consider it, to be yeah, honest. He's he he would he was very, have you ever seen The Legend of Ben Hall? No. Okay, we'll let it that bit out when we send it to him, and we'll just make you say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. He, I, honestly, he's just he's just finished working up on a um uh, uh like a uh, it's not a horror, it's more like a thriller um called The Cost. So uh, I reckon he would. Yeah, I mean he he's always looking for new projects. I could see, I just I could just see this book. Even well, I've only read the first one, but I could see them easily coming into like a a, a mini, even a mini series. You know what I mean? But um. In saying that, um, do you so you, you you're obviously going to plan on keep writing. So you want you've got more stories to tell, not just from the Jared O'Connor side of things, but in general. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. And I suppose for me, it depends on making decision about what my future is going to be with yeah. whether I can sustain, um, you know, riding full time. Um, for me, trying to be a policeman and riding full time is it, it is a, it's a battle more so because of the conflict of interest or at least possibilities of conflict of interest or the perception. So you always got to be very careful about making sure that everything you're doing is is proper. And I make a point of stressing that what I'm writing is fiction. So, but yeah, that, that does cause an issue for me. Um, so depending on what my future will be as to whether uh, I can I can take this to the next level, I'd like to be able to. At the moment, I'm, I'm in the process of editing book two in the series, which is called The Demons Woke. And then book three is called The Shadows Watch. So the three books are The Angels Wept, The Demons Woke and The Shadows Watch. Um, so I've really got a lot of work ahead of me with the editing and, and pre-launch work for book two and book three, plus this fourth book, which is currently with editors and, and, a, and a publisher here in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a book that's coming out. It's being launched in August called The Ghost Train and The Scarlet Moon. It's completely cool. different to the crime genre. It's a historical speculative fiction. It goes back in time. There's a this uh, rare blood moon lunar event creates this, this time slip and there's a bit of time travel involved. Um, and it's a bit of a coming of age thing. It's kind of, if you kind of picture Stranger Things, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of set in 1982 and then it goes across into different time time um, periods, jumps ahead into the future, but it's very based around these kids on an adventure and one of them um, mysteriously vanishes and, and it's about unraveling the mystery of what, what happened to him. Um, so I wanted to write something completely different away from the crime genre and I really enjoyed that. Uh, and 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 for future projects, even though I've got a lot of ideas bouncing around my head at the moment, I am focused on editing um, all the marketing pre-launch for for the for the four books that I've got on the go at the moment. But I, I figure when book five comes around, I'd really like to write something more in that style. That um, I, I like writing something with a slight paranormal twist in the real world it's that question of what if what if, what if that happened what if someone could go back in time or, yeah and it's, so it's set in the real world but it's like questions we always ask ourselves and and i really like those kind of stories 100 percent. so you said that one's coming out in august is that correct yeah so it's actually coming out in between book one and book two of my crime series so it's yeah. kind of going to be just a standalone book yeah. um and something a little bit different so uh, we've already got the the launch date set for august Excellent. Um, and soon i'll start sort of um you know, we're currently working with uh, cover designers mm -hmm. to get the cover just right. Um, and then hopefully in the next sort of month or so, I'll be able to start doing some pre-launch marketing about around that book. So um, it's kind of, I've kind of um, done a bit back to front. I've kind of done it in the middle of my crime series, but um, I'll then be able to focus my energies on, on that book. And then next year, really start to ramp up my crime series. Excellent, excellent. I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for that. Is that going to be out on all the usuals like Amazon and everywhere? Yeah. Yeah, that's, and, and paperback as well. Excellent, excellent. Oh, well, that's that's fantastic. I um yeah, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for that one. Um, but yeah, so just to confirm, that one's August. The second book in the Jared O'Connor story is next year. Yeah, at this stage, because book four is sort of coming in as it's been kind of inserted in, in the middle. Yeah. Um, just you know, to kind of give the readers uh, exposure to something different, to, yep. and it, it's it's written in a completely different style as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that'll that'll be good for me to get some feedback from the readers in terms of you know, and and also showing people that I can I can write in different genres. Yeah. Um, and then I'll I'll continue to really ramp up the the marketing for book two, um, and book three early next year. Excellent, excellent. Oh, that's great. Wonderful. Um, well, before we let you go, just do you have any advice for writers, particularly those that may want to start writing mysteries or cat and mouse kind of thrillers? Uh, as you're saying, Ryan, you know, write what you know. And, and uh, I'm lucky that I've got the policing background that's helped me with my crime writing. But um, I, I just think follow your instinct, follow your gut feeling. For, for people that write, if you were to ask, why do you do that? Why do you subject yourself to hours of solitude and 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 fears of, of rejection and hoping that what you write people are going to like and reading it and getting sick of reading your own words and all the editing and why would you subject yourself to that but you know i can't answer that question it's that question of you know why do painters paint or what a sculptor sculpt writers write because they just kind of feel like they have to and yeah. it's 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 inside you it's something inherent about you and and for me i kind of probably stifled the signs for a long time and probably the environment that I was working in really stifled my creativity being a policeman. It was kind of not the done thing. You know, you, 
kind of a bit bit wanky if I can say it. You know, I was very concerned about how, what my colleagues would think if they found out. Okay. So I kept it a secret for years and years. And it wasn't until more recently that I've kind of had the courage to come out of the closet, so to speak, and and say, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. And to my surprise, I've had nothing but overwhelming support from from my colleagues and people that I thought wouldn't support me. They just think it's really cool that that what I'm doing. So I think follow your heart. If you feel you want to do it, it's it's hard work. Uh, um, but if you if you push through it, get advice, get feedback. That's so important. And you know, don't be precious about the feedback. Um, work with editors, yeah. um, and just just keep pushing on and um, and and keep don't lose sight of the end game. Because writing a, an eighty thousand word manuscript will take a long time, and so you have got to be in it for the long game. And and mm. nothing. It is a very slow grind, but just keep chipping away, and, and you'll start to have these small wins. For me, my probably the, the biggest breakthrough was was having some success in some writing competitions. Um, okay. I was shortlisted in a in the Wattpad um, writing oh, yeah. uh, awards a couple of years ago, and that was a, that was a real validation that yeah, look, I, I can do this. And uh, and then recently, I was um, I came second overall in a, in, a, in a writing contest held by um, Hawkeye Publishing, which is oh, wow. a publishing company which has since signed me. So getting involved in, in entering and entering and having the courage to enter into competitions, mm-hmm. um, even short story competitions, is a really good way to get noticed. So. Just if you feel it in your heart, just do it. Have a crack, and and uh, and you know, everyone's idea of success is different. Yeah. If your success is to have something completed and not even published, you know, don't let that don't let that hold you back. No, I think I think that's really good advice, especially about you know, getting getting a feel and getting some of the work out there. I'm I'm very lucky that two of my best friends are writers, so I get to read some of this stuff, <laughs> um, you know, to provide some feedback before it even comes out, and that's just. You know, I, I think that's, as someone like myself who does a hell of a lot of reading, um, I've been sort of able to provide some feedback as a, as a read. I have to try and separate it as a reader and as a friend. So I have to say, you know, because that's at the end of the day, I want, I want these guys to, I want you to succeed. And, you know, th- there's no point in me sugarcoating everything. And I think that is a very good thing to do. I mean, your heart's got to be in it. You've got to be in it for the long haul, as you say. You can't just write a book in a week. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and you have to get independent. Like to lose focus, you know. Yeah, and there's no good, you know, giving it to your your friends and family, and they all say it's wonderful. You know, you yeah. do have to get give it to independent yeah. people who are going to give you some uh, honest feedback. And and for me, with my fourth book, which is coming out later in the year, I, I went through a number of beta readers and editors, um, and it wasn't until I sent it to. Uh, part of my publishing contract was, you know, working with a, an, an editor to do a, a manuscript assessment, and the editor was fantastic, but she was brutal, and I knew she was going to be brutal. And mm-hmm. she read read through it, sent me back a twenty page manuscript report, basically saying I need to delete redundant characters, I need to delete scenes that were slowing the storyline down, uh, I need to change the setting, and and it was very overwhelming. But I applied all the advice and I made all the necessary changes, and it's far it's a far better book than what it was when I, even after it had gone through many, many layers of editing. So to have someone go right through it and, and say, look, the book, you know, the pacing is not right here or you've, you've waffled on too long, get rid of this and, you know, cull these 10 pages. And you think, oh, you know, there's a saying, kill your darlings, but you just have to. And, and the advice was I had a redundant character um, who really was there, but wasn't progressing the story. And then I just got rid of that character and it just really tightened up the storyline. So uh, being prepared to to work on it and work on it. I think that the biggest mistake we can all do when we're first setting out is to you know self-publish something that's just undercooked and un- unedited and you're not doing yourself a favour. You've got to be patient and get it yeah. done properly before it goes out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's something... Look, I, I was in the same... When I first wrote my first book, I was so keen to get it out. But, um, you know, I, I learned later that and I look back in the stuff I wrote 20 years ago, and it's bloody awful. It really is. And it makes me realize how much I've improved since then. But I can recognize how bad my writing was back then. And I thought I was really good back then. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's taken me 20 years to really do. I've done writing courses and, and worked hard to develop the skill of the craft of writing. And I've still got a long way to go. and I'm constantly learning. Um, but you've got to work hard at that. And always yeah, every everything you write should always be a continual improvement. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that you're willing to keep learning is half the battle there. You know, there's a lot of people who will write and will just get it out there and don't care what other people think. And, you know, and then they're sort of, I don't need to go to lessons or anything like that. If you're not learning something, 
you know, every with every book you write, I think that's a big step in becoming a better author. Oh, absolutely. And there's so many nuances in in the craft of writing that you, you know, uh, first person, third person, point yeah. of view, um, showing, not telling, all these things. And and when you read a, a really good book, you don't pick, you know, it, it's such a, a smooth reading experience. But when you read a, a book that's not well written, it's clunky and, and it, it's not smooth when you read it. So um, I'm currently getting my fourth book edited by by my publisher who's also an experienced editor and she's been absolutely brutal getting rid of redundant words and when i look at her editing um, and she's culling sentences right down but it makes for a much smoother reading experience and we do use way too many words in our sentences and sometimes the, the most simple way to describe something is the best way flows a lot better you're going to get a lot more people finishing the book rather than getting 10 15 20 pages in and going you know what, i'll just finish that later you know, at the end of the day, and, and people just don't get around to doing that. So, yeah, um, I mean, I, I, that's what I mean. I must admit your book was the first one I've gone, oh, I'm up to chapter 12 already. <laughs> and you know, so it's, yeah, you can tell you've got the experience. You can tell you've done the work. You've taken the feedback and obviously it's been well edited as well. And yeah, you know, I'm just, uh, yeah, as I said, can't say enough good things about it. Great. Well, I mean, and just finally, I was very much um, influenced by James Patterson ah, in yes. my early days. And I've tried to, he's, he's banging out books every year and he's probably one of the biggest selling authors around the world now. Um, but he, he writes, his, his chapters uh, are short. He doesn't describe things in a convoluted way. Um, he's to the point, but the stories flow and, and progress really quickly. So um, I was influenced by his style of writing and, and I've kind of not tried to mimic it, but I've, I've definitely used that as a guide in the way I write as well. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, he, the man must be doing something right because. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he's, probably sitting on, he's probably sitting on his piles of money every night and going, yeah. oh, I might write another book next week. Next I'm year. sure there's these literary scholars and these literary buffs who kind of <laughs> look down their nose, you know, at the likes of you know, James, <laughs> oh, commercial fiction. But I'll tell you what, you know, you look at James Patterson, um, you know, we, we all can't be writing uh, masterpieces, but people just want to write something. As There's so much stuff going on in the world and people just want want a bit of escapism. Yeah, 100%. That's right. 100%. And that's that's the best thing. I, that's what I, I, I really love the fact that I can get into a book where I, everything else just drops away for a while, even if it's just for two, three hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Drop yeah. away and just forget about everything and then deal with it after you've had that experience. So 100%. Yeah. Right. One last question before you go. Um, favorite cop show or, or movie is there, is there one that, that you absolutely love that's accurate doesn't annoy you when, when they do something that's not you know proper yeah I'm always my, my, my wife obeys me in the ribs all the time and I'm watching cop shows and I think oh that's ridiculous yeah. um, I watched a movie last night called um, Cop Shop it's an American movie it's mm -hmm. a fairly recent one on Netflix it was good it was good entertainment but there was so many things I was thinking that's just not real that wouldn't happen and you know cowboy cops and I'm thinking oh yeah. such a cowboy um, I, years ago I used to really enjoy the Australian TV series Blue Healers I love yes, that that was, go. Done. That's that was pretty good it was sometimes it was a bit not inaccurate but that was based yeah. on the um, Victorian police but I love Blue Healers me too it, it was a cracker I went out and um, I think about a year ago and spent, I think about $500 I bought. They released all the collections. So every episode on DVD, I now completely own. I grew up on Blue Healers and I, yeah. I, that is my favorite, favorite show. I, not just in police dramas of all time. Yeah. And I used to, used to tape it on my, my VHS video recorder if I was at work or something. And I'd always tape the, re, yeah. tape the episodes and watch them. And yeah, I loved it. So Blue Hill is, I think is my favourite. And that's another show where a lot of, you see, I watched, the, I watched an episode in the first season with Hugh Jackman. And like <laughs> is that said, right? Yeah, yeah he, was, he played a lawyer in one of the, I think it was around episode 12 or 13. He played a police, he played the uh, police prosecutor. And I've gone, hold on, is that because it was so long ago? I had to IMDB it and yeah, it's had heat. They've had get it. his claws out. Yeah. <laughs> Hugh Jackman, Wolverine himself. I reckon, I reckon Blue Hill has launched a lot of Australian actors' yeah. careers. Yeah. And, and I'll just um, two others, just really quickly, two yep. um, American ones. There's a series uh, called um, True Detective. Yes, um, love the, it. There's three, three series. I definitely enjoyed the first series better with uh, Matthew McConaughey and um, really gritty in the sort of Southlands of America. I love that one. And the other one I like is called um, Sinner. It's oh yes, just, yeah, yeah. Um, quirky detective Harry Ambrose. This oh. has been three seasons. I really like that as well. 
Yeah, with uh, Bill Pullman, I think it is. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I, do, I got into that not long ago. I started watching it because I heard um, I heard uh, Jessica Beale was really good in the in the first season. Yeah, and um, I ju- I was hooked, and then I, I've I've only watched the first two seasons so far. Um, but um, yeah, look, I hundred percent agree with that. That's a hidden gem. That one, not a lot of people know about it. Yeah, no, I'd recommend. I just finished watching season three. I'd, I'd recommend season three. So okay. You know, yeah, look, I've, I've I've got a big week this week. I'm a wrestling fan, and it's a big wrestling week. But I, I'll jump on it when I can. But yeah, look, I reckon uh, Bill Pullman as how, as uh, you know that detective is fantastic. Yep, excellent, wonderful. Well, just before you go, and I know I've said that about three times, I uh, just want to let us, our, our listeners know where they can get your books, where they can follow you, and all that stuff. Just plug whatever you want to plug. Yeah, look, I'm I'm probably more active on Instagram. Just a Jack Roney writer. And my website jackroney.com.au. Um, and of course, Amazon is where you can get the ebook. But you can also, for people in Australia, you can go to my website, and I'm happy to send out a, a signed copy of the paperback as well. Um, so yeah, just just Google Jack Roney uh, author, and and you'll find me. And we're going to put we'll put all that information in the show notes as well, yep. and we'll make a uh, Jamie's really good with the editing. I'm sure we'll make it pop up so people can just click on it and right. Right over Ryan's face. Um, yeah, right over my, I don't care. The book's that good. Put it over my face. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give up some of my face time for that. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on, Jack. Thank you. No, thanks, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure, Jamie and Ryan, to have a, have a, a yak to you. And I, I really appreciate you uh, reaching out and uh, yeah, any help to promote. And I'll certainly be happy to promote you what you guys are doing. I think it's fantastic how you're promoting writers uh, on your podcast. So well done. And if you know anyone that wants to come on, we are more than happy to get anyone on. Yeah, we we don't just we we'll we'll speak to anyone about anything about you know we just want to help people get their books out. That you know, I mean, I would never have found your book if I if Jamie didn't let me know that you were coming on the show because I'd like to try and do research. And I'm glad that he did. You know, so many we want to try and help people because there's not enough people reading in this world. Mm. You know what I mean? And we need to get more more people in the books. Absolutely. 100%. Don't forget, guys, you can check it out. The Angel's Web, it's on Amazon. I bought it on Kindle the other day or jump on Jack's website and make a purchase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.